If you'd like to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Again, a scripture I'm sure you're very familiar with. And throughout the today, there have been a there's been a, a constant reference to obviously the ministries that we see listed behind me there, but in this particular way, in terms of this calling, and we've even in the prayer now, uh, Mark made reference to this calling that we have. And um, in Ephesians chapter one, you'll see in verse one, uh, sorry, chapter four, verse one. Paul makes reference to this calling. Um, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, and again we see that word beseech, I beg you, um, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So there is a vocation, and we are called to that vocation. Um, and I th think sometimes we use that interchangeably, this idea of vocation and calling. Um, often when you're talking about the ministry, and in other denominations, uh, when someone is, is called to take on the full-time job of being a pastor in a church, they speak about this calling. And it's made to be a very mysterious thing. And I don't know if you fast and pray before you know what your calling is, or how you come by the knowledge that you are called, um, if you simply have an interest in the job, uh, I don't know. But this calling that we have is not the same thing. Um, this is a calling that is a calling that is made by God um, in Christ. Uh, and it's a calling that we have by virtue of Christ in us. So the person who truly then is called is Christ. Um, the Lord Jesus, and we often make reference to this, and I know I often make reference to this, he says, I come to do thy will, O God. So the Lord Jesus himself didn't make that decision. He didn't say, look, I'm going to now go and do this, Father. But the Father had a purpose. He said, well, there's only one man for the job, and it's the Son. Um, and the Lord Jesus is specifically and uniquely equipped and qualified for the task that he was given. And so he was called to do the work of the Father on the cross of Calvary. And you and I are called to do the work of the Son. So what is the work of the Son? He's already died on the cross, but that really was just the first part. The second part is the building of the church. And so, in that sense, the Lord Jesus came not only to die on the cross, but to build the church. And so, that is his calling, and it's our calling in Christ Jesus. So, if we are going to talk about our vocation, this then is our vocation. We're apostles or prophets or evangelists or pastors or teachers. So, that's the vocation. That's the, the place and the position we have, not only in Christ, but in the body of Christ. So I, I, I know it's difficult sometimes to think, not think of these ministries simply as skills. And, and I think sometimes we do have that habit of talking about them in terms of skills. Paul himself says of the apostolic measure and speaking of himself, he says, I am a wise master. Builder. So his vocation is to lay the foundation and to establish the believers on that foundation, to see them grow up into Christ. And he really finishes the, the vision or the, the parameters of that vocation because he says, I am espousing you to Christ, to one husband. So really in, in his vision of his job, the thing that he has to do, it wasn't just to lay a foundation. It wasn't just to take men and women and see them established on it, but the completion of that work, to see them married to Christ. Uh, he wants to see them in heaven. So his vision and his uh, concept of what he has to do is not small, it's in fact quite small. It's a complete work that he understands that he has. And for a prophet or a teacher or a pastor or an evangelist, uh, we need to, in the same sense, have a complete view and vision of what our task, our, our place, our job, if you want to even use that term, um, in the work that you and I must do. So we've been called 
to do that work. So I, I don't have, and, and we speak like this, I think we say, well, well, you have the gift, the measure of a pastor. So you do so-and-so, but you're also a pastor. But really the idea is that you are the pastor, so-and-so. You are the apostle, so-and-so. You are the teacher, so-and-so. You are the evangelist, so-and-so. So we are, in Christ, this measure. Um, I certainly have my own identity and have my own thoughts and have my own will, but what did the Lord Jesus show us in terms of that? He said, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, I think we can be sure the Lord Jesus had very certain and strong ideas about those who were lost. Um, and we see some of uh, his feeling to the hypocrites of Israel, to the money lenders and uh, coin exchangers that he finds in the temple. Um, and he, there's, that's one aspect of his own personal feeling towards those that are engaged in those activities. And yet there is an overriding purpose and desire that is within his heart. Um, and something that was said earlier, uh, Rupert speaking about how will we know what this measure is, he spoke about that inner drive, that sense of purpose and direction, this idea that this is what I must and need to do. Um, and it's a, that, that's probably at the, the top end of the spectrum, in the sense of um, all is, is in fact well with your, your soul. Can I put it like that? Because when you're not well, when you're not right, when you have those things, as we've heard, in place, in fact, there is no drive within you. Um, there is, in fact, a blockage. Uh, there is no sense of your identity in Christ because you have no real connection and relationship with the Lord Jesus. So if we are going to find these measures realized in a very practical and real way, if we're going to find that drive that, that informs us of the purpose that we have in the Lord Jesus, that I, I am able to set my hand to whatever work the Lord gives me, to, to find that I have eyes for the opportunities that are there, I need to establish my relationship with the Lord Jesus. There is, there is no other place to start. I need to make sure that my relationship with the Lord Jesus is, is working, that I can draw deep from the well of that relationship. Um, the problem, however, is that too often the well of our relationship with Christ is blocked with all sorts of rubbish and detritus and the things of this life. And that's really what we, we, we were speaking about this morning, about the things that rule us. Because isn't that what a king is? Someone who governs and rules us. Um, and so those things aren't just excuses, and, and, and I think we make small of them when we say they're just excuses and self-justifications, but the fact is that there is something else that is preventing us from enjoying the fullness of the relationship we have available to us in the Lord Jesus. And I need to be able to draw deep from that relationship. Because this ministry, this measure, um, is the measure of Christ. It is Christ the Apostle, that measure in you. Christ the Prophet, Christ the Teacher, Christ the Pastor, Christ the Evangelist. So the Apostle Paul, as he exercised his measure, um, and we, we, we can sort of look at Paul, and, and he had a specific focus. He was the Apostle to the Gentiles. And in his focus, he had very unique issues and problems um, in dealing with the Gentiles. And so you'll find that his measure and his, his expression of that measure will take a particular form. Uh, you can contrast him with men like Peter. Peter was a, a, a apostle to the Jew, a very different set of problems. Um, the one were incredibly licentious, um, and Paul had to rein them in. The other was incredibly legal, and Peter had to say, look, listen up, find the liberty that is in Christ. So we mustn't mistake the expression of the measure for the task that is being performed. We've got to find in each and every one of us, and it was really nicely said uh, by Tony, that we're not comparing ourselves one with another. Each of us in 
our application will find a particular expression that will be unique to the calling upon our lives. So we can't compare ourselves to one another. Um, we can look at Paul and say, you know, he wrote most of the New Testament. Um, the teaching that we have concerning um, righteousness and justification uh, of the liberty that we have in Christ, all the major teaching comes from the Apostle Paul. And so we can elevate him and say, well, if this is an apostle, well, that's the, the pattern. And I can't wonder that there wasn't just one apostle on those little notices today because we look at Paul and say, well, I'm not the Paul. But you know what? There was an Apollos, and there was a Timothy, there was a Titus, there was uh, an Aquila, um, there was a Barnabas, there was a Silas. And you know what? They all expressed themselves in another different way. Um, were they greater or lesser than Paul? Well, you know what? In this measure, it's only Christ. It's only Christ. And we, we got to put a, a number to how we felt we, we were in that measure in that terms of the development. Um, and, and maybe that's the sense we have of, of how we are finding the expression of that measure. But here is the truth, that that measure is always at 100%. Christ didn't give you one of ten or two of ten. He gave you a hundred of a hundred. And so it's really just us holding back the potential of the measure that we have been given. And where do we fall down? Where does the hurdle appear? Faith. The simple answer is faith. It really is. We don't confidence in the Christ whose measure we have been gifted with. And I want us to go to Luke chapter 7. And again, you'll be very familiar with this account. But when we read this, often we focus on the faith aspect. But this man makes something really clear in principle that I'd like to draw on as we, we look at it. But just so that we remember the, the scripture, Luke chapter 7, verse 1. And remember, this is right after his Sermon on the Mount. So the Lord Jesus had now been teaching on the Mount, and I find it very significant that after his teaching, we now get in chapter 7 uh, a demonstration of the power uh, that Christ has in terms of these miracles and signs and wonders. Um, and it says here in verse 7, uh, sorry, verse 1 of Luke 7, Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. It's important to understand the context that this centurion is a Roman. He is a Gentile dog. The Lord Jesus is a recognized a holy man among the people of Israel, um, and he's, although uh, with much grudging and um, other ideas of catching him up, he's being fated by all the, the who's who um, in Israel. All the Pharisees and the Sadducees are there. He's invited into people's homes. He's given place. Um, and he, wherever he goes, there's this um, great fanfare about the signs and the wonders and the teaching. Um, so this centurion um, certainly has a connection with the people that he has interaction with there, and he's, he's going the extra mile to ingratiate himself to Israel. He's a friend to them. He builds them a synagogue. But he understands that if on any other level, if he's going to appeal to any other of the, the so-called great men of, of Israel, uh, very few of them, in fact probably none of them, would venture into his house. They wouldn't go and sit, put their feet uh, across his threshold. And so he sends Jews, elders of that place, to him to plead on his behalf and say, look, I'm a Gentile, I'm a centurion, I'm a, a captain of these most despised enemies of yours, but I humbly beg you to, to come and help me 
because my servant who is very dear to me is about to die. And really what this challenges me about the centurion's um, approach to the Lord Jesus is he's never heard him. He's never ever sat under his ministry. He's never ever seen him perform a single ministry. All he knows is he knows him by reputation. So it's the reputation of the Lord Jesus that has grabbed his attention. Um, and he calls for him and these guys plead on their behalf and off the Lord Jesus goes and he's not even at the house. And it says here um, in verse 6, And Jesus went with him and he was now not far from the house. The centurion sent friends to him saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but to say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. So he's saying, I am unworthy of this thing that I'm asking of you. I'm unworthy of you coming in uh, under the roof of my house, but I have confidence in your ability to just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Now the response of the Lord Jesus to that statement and what he has to say afterwards is, I have not found so great faith in all of Israel. So what was his faith in? And, and we'll talk a little bit more about his statement now, but what did he believe in? He's not heard him preach. He doesn't know any of his doctrine. He's not seen the miracles himself. He's only heard about it. But wherein lies his confidence? Pardon me? In his testimony? Jesus' word? Well, he hasn't really come under that word. So it's just reputation. The testimony of others, uh, they certainly have relayed a certain information, a fact to him, upon which confidence now rests. And this is what he says. He says here in verse 8, he says, For I also am a man set under authority. And this is his confidence. His confidence is in the authority of Jesus Christ. He's never heard him, he's never seen him, but what he knows from the reports that he's heard is this is a man in authority. And he says, look, I'm not putting my confidence in what I've heard. I'm not putting my confidence in what has been purported to have been done, um, the miracles, the signs, the wonders. I recognize that you have authority. And I understand what authority is. And I know how it works. And so wherein is his confidence? Where is his faith? In the authority vested in Jesus Christ. And why does the Lord Jesus say, I have not found so great faith in all of Israel? Because there was no one in Israel who recognized that the Lord Jesus had authority. Remember when the Lord Jesus heals a man and he says, your sin is forgiven you? What happens? All of Israel is in an uproar. They want to stone him and say, who gives you the right to forgive a man's sin? And he says, well, what's the difference? Shall I say, your sin is forgiven you, or rise up and walk? He's talking about his authority as the Son of God. He's talking about his authority to forgive sin and to raise men and women from the dead. And so this man recognizes that he has authority. And he says, I am also a man under authority. And he goes on and he says there, and I say unto one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And so when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. I like that, to think that the Lord Jesus, who knows all things, actually marveled. He thought, at last, someone, someone, Father, someone has got the idea. The pen is dropped, at last. And maybe sometimes we're in that position. We need someone to hammer home the point. And, and so... The thing that's really on my heart is this idea of the authority that is in the Lord Jesus. And when we see what the Father says about the Lord Jesus, has He not given Him all authority? And all authority and an absolute authority that is vested in the Lord Jesus. Um, and so He's able to forgive sin. He's able to heal. He's able to fulfill the vocation wherewith he has been called. So how does the Lord Jesus accomplish his task? 
He accomplishes it by the authority that he has. And in fact, it's an authority that has been given to him. It's been given to him by the Father. And so, if we think about authority, there are two things that immediately spring to mind. Oh, well, certainly to my mind. I'm hoping they spring to your mind. So when we speak about authority, what else do you think of instantly? So with authority comes power. Responsibility is the other one. Exactly, and with responsibility comes accountability. So was the Lord Jesus not given authority to exercise his apostolic ministry? Absolutely. He was given power to exercise that apostolic ministry, and he would be held accountable by the Father for the performance of the task. So what was required? He needed to take responsibility. And I think this is really what we've been sort of going around the edges as we've been talking, is that we need to take responsibility for the gift which we have been given. So if I'm an apostle, I have a responsibility to fulfill that vocation. So if I have a responsibility, there will be an accounting. There will be an, an accounting. But with the gift comes the power and the authority to perform the task. So I don't need to worry about can I or can't I. I don't need to worry about whether or not the task is too great or I am too inept. The fact is, when I was given the gift, I was given both the authority and the power. Because it's not vested in me, it is vested in Christ. But let's just consider the Lord Jesus for a moment. When he ministered among us on the earth, did he utilize his own power? Because he had set aside his heavenly glory, didn't he? And he took upon himself the form of a, a man, a servant. He was in all ways like you and me. So the Lord Jesus, in exercising his apostolic ministry, exercising his prophetic ministry, exercising his evangelistic ministry, his pastoral ministry, and his teaching ministry, did it as a man. He did it as a man. By the power of the Holy Ghost. So, in a practical sense, and this is something that just stirred my own heart, you get the well. They've been traveling for the whole day, they're hungry, they're tired, and the disciples say, look, Lord, just rest here and we'll go on and get some provisions. We'll find some meat. And the Lord Jesus sitting there uh, waiting for them. Along comes a Samaritan woman. And we, we know the story well and the interaction they have. But he has now input into her life. And in fact, we can say he, he, he had input in all aspects of his ministry because there was teaching in the, that discussion, wasn't there? Teaching about the temple and the relationship between the people. Was there not a strong evangelistic um, call upon the woman? Was there not a prophetic um, exhortation to that woman? Was there not a taking of not only that woman, but those that then subsequently come from the city and establishing them upon a foundation? Um, I know in a, sort of like in a very limited way, but all aspects were there. But what really stirs my heart is that he doesn't use any ability or power that is outside of your and my reach. But what, what does he make use of? The ministry, yes, it's there, but how is that ministry expressed? the word under the unction of the Holy Ghost. But there's more than that. It is through one of the of the Holy Ghost. And now, I want to say it's more than the gift of discernment, 
It was the word of knowledge. It was a word of knowledge. So he makes use of one of the gifts of the word. Knowledge. So that really leads us to this place where, and I think sometimes this is what we do, we separate these gifts from the gifts of the Holy Ghost. But in fact, they go hand in hand. And how powerful an input has any of these ministries when combined with those gifts, which find an expression and a usefulness in all sorts of different situations. So, there really is a, a supernatural, so more than flesh and blood, input and impact that this measure and gift has and its expression in terms of power. We heard of the prophet this morning who said, look, it's not going to rain for three years until I say. Now, I see in that a definite authority, don't you? There's authority in that statement. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. 100% right. So, here we are. And we have this measure of the Lord Jesus, and vested in that measure is the authority to use it. The power to make it effective. And the responsibility and accountability that ensures that it is that fruit. So, absolutely. But it's placed specifically in the authority that Jesus Christ has. So that's where my faith is. So I can stand up and say, no, I believe that Christ has authority. But there has to be a practical demonstration that I am under authority. So what is that practical demonstration? How do I show I'm under authority? Sorry? Obey? I didn't hear you so much. Die daily? Obey? Sacrifice? In presenting your body? Sorry? Yes? Mission? Yes? Yes. Well, can we take everything that everyone said and sort of bring it to a, a few points? And let's just say, in order to be an authority, I need to actively submit. And that submission is seen as obeying. And if I'm going to, to be someone who obeys, I'm someone who does. I'm someone who does. So I'm active. I'm doing that which I have been um, told to do. But this idea of submission goes further, and I think it was Franco that made mention to this, um, now is that we are in submission one to another. So the very real way in which I, I truly demonstrate that I'm maybe a man of authority, I'm also a man under authority, is that I submit to you, and you submit to me. So that submission, and, and we, we certainly um, can't think of ourselves better than each other, we can't think we have all the answers, but how do you and I now submit, and, and you, you're speaking about giving place to one another, um, how do we actively, properly show this submission? Sorry. Love for one another, but in a very practical way, we work together. 
all ministries need to find that we aren't operating alone, we're operating together. Um, so I suppose we can say, well, the apostle has the vision. Is it the apostle's vision only? No, it is the vision of the apostle Christ Jesus. But all have the vision. We must all have the vision. Because if I don't have the same vision as you have, we're going to be pulling different directions. We must all have the same vision. Who, who stirs us to, to take hold of that vision and to press on with that vision? Sorry? The prophetic ministry. The prophetic ministry. And, and I find it really interesting um, that it was the prophets and the teachers that were spending time in prayer and the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas. I don't know if um, in, in that fellowship the pastors and the evangelists had their time together, I'm not sure, but it seemed at that point, for whatever reason, the prophets and the teachers, and I suppose in, in our, our caricatured idea of what the ministries are, you probably can't get two more opposite <laughs> ministries. The effervescent, come, let's do this, anything is possible, and, um, and then they're thinking, no, the more regulate, no, 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 let's keep it in the... Parameters. But you know what? I don't think that's true at all. I don't think that's true at all. But there was a working together. There was an understanding that no ministry, no one man had the vision, owned the vision, could um, unfold the vision. Um, as we come together this afternoon, what have we done? We have seen the direction of the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost that has been revealing the mind of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus. And how has he done that? Through each and every ministry. And whether it is a prayer or a spiritual gift or input or a scripture, what has he done? He's moved within the parameter of the measure. And we have had the mind of Christ because we have worked together. May God just take these things and quicken them to our hearts and enlighten our understanding. When we get to that point, we're off track. We could never even say that this aspect of church business is only for that man. Yeah. All ministries are functioning in every manner and in every aspect. What 
knowledge that, that, that I need to grow in this program, correct? I want students to learn more lessons, but this is going to be more that I can, I can develop in that as well. Uh, so I think that is what I'm going to talk about. Add to that, kind of grouping together and getting everybody to talk about very specifically uh, what is the system. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll ask the idea of doing that because that's exactly what we were going to do. <laughs> we went there to go into groups of four, but what we were going to do is turn our chairs around and all face each other and spend time talking to the Lord and telling Him how much we need Him in the call that He placed upon our lives. Because, you know, without Him, we're going nowhere. Even if we realize we need to go. You, know, you can recognize that you need to do something. But the fact that you recognize it doesn't mean that you actually don't do it. So this is going to be more than just a, a, an exercise in which we come to an understanding of our position. This is going to be a moment of commitment to the Lord Jesus. Because we're committing to His Authority. And I think that the centurion man did that, didn't he? He said, I am a man under authority. I am a man in authority. And I'm also under authority. So he knew what it meant to have authority. He's a centurion. centurion. So he, what is a centurion? He's a captain of our disorder. That means he's in authority. He's also under authority. So he knows both sides of the problem. Um, and he says, but your kind of authority, I'm not familiar with. Please can you exercise your authority in my life. Now, we need to submit to his authority so that we can experience his power in our life. Can you turn our people around?